Hello friends, welcome to Drishti and I am Anand. Friends, in this video, we are going to discuss the detailed syllabus of CUET with regard to economics subject. Friends, the CUET is all about the common universities entrance test, a test, a common test for the admission to undergraduate program to 45 central universities. In that context, friends, in this video, we are going to see all about what is all in the syllabus of economics. Friends, before we proceed, let's have a look at the pattern of the examination. In the CUET, economics part, the whole syllabus is classified or divided into three broad parts. Friends, one part is actually about the introductory microeconomics. The second part would be introductory macroeconomics. And the third part, friends, would be about the India's economic development. So, before we proceed, let's have a broad look at the whole syllabus. Friends, with respect to economy, the whole syllabus have three major broad parts which are further divided into 10 units, which we are going to see one by one. The paper will have 50 questions, out of which at least 40 will have to be attempted and that is how we can qualify our entrance examination for the entry to the central universities for the undergraduate program. Friends, if you are, uh, we proceed ahead, you see, among the three parts, the first unit is the introduction to microeconomics. So friends, this part is actually covering the first part. The first unit in the syllabus is about the first part, that is the introductory microeconomics. All the chapters, all the units that you are going to see are from the class 12th and class 11th NCERT. So if we are thorough with the NCERT discussion, if we are thorough with the content, friends, the exam is with us. We are easily able to crack the exam. So let's have a look at the syllabus. Unit 1 belongs to the introductory microeconomics in which we have to see the basic definition of microeconomics, that what is the microeconomics. So when we study, we shall be discussing the concept of microeconomics along with the macroeconomics. Friends, in the microeconomics, we often discuss, we study the behavior of a consumer or a firm as to how they make a decision with respect to some resources. So this part, this unit will contain the study of individuals, and firms with respect to their economic decisions, economic behavior. But friends, what happens is, it has a central problem. The problem with the producers. The problem is that what is to be produced. So, when we will discuss the central problem, we shall see that the problems are what is to be produced and in what quantities. how or by whom the production will have to be done and the last would be how the production will take place. So friends, in general you see the central problems with respect to microeconomics is about what is to be produced, how it is to be produced and by whom it has to be produced. So friends, these topics would be covered in the first unit of the syllabus with respect to the microeconomics we shall see in the great details along with the possible questions. The second unit, friends you see, if you go and look at the class 12th NCERT microeconomics part, the first unit belongs to chapter number 1 of class 12th NCERT microeconomics and similarly the chapter 2 of class 12th 
माइक्रो इकोनॉमिक्स इट कवर्स एक्चुअली द सेकेंड यूनिट डीलिंग विद द कंज्यूमर बिहेवियर एंड डिमांड इन दिस यूनिट फ्रेंड्स वी शेल बी लुकिंग एट द कंज्यूमर्स इक्विब्रियम यू सी इक्विब्रियम इज अ स्टेट ऑफ बैलेंस बिटवीन अ सिंगल कॉमोडिटी और से टू कॉमोडिटीज सो फ्रेंड्स इन दिस पार्ट वी आर गोइंग टू सी द मीनिंग ऑफ द इक्विब्रियम द अटेनमेंट ऑफ इक्विब्रियम थ्रू यूटिलिटी काइंड ऑफ सेटिस्फैक्शन फ्रेंड्स यू सी and we shall be looking at that when the consumption increases the satisfaction for the same good may go down and when the consumption is lower from a commodity the satisfaction may be higher so the concept of satisfaction is actually the concept of utility so we are going to see in detail about the concept of utility which leads to or say equilibrium so equilibrium utility through the one and the two commodity cases that when a spender a consumer has to spend the money among the two commodities how they try to maximize the satisfaction of the two commodities so this unit friends will be containing our discussion on the consumers equilibrium after that we shall be discussing the concept of demand the demand the market demand and the determinants of demand you friends you see the willingness and the capacity of a consumer is actually his or her demand a person is willing to buy something but is not able to buy the commodity will not convert into a demand in the market so in this part we should be looking at the determinants of the demand the demand schedule the demand of a given commodity with respect to the price of the commodities how the demand changes with the price of the commodity because we know that as the price increases the demand suffers and vice versa at times so in this part friends we are going to see the demand schedule the demand curve the shift in the demand curve due to multiple factors and you see friends the price elasticity of demand we shall see how the demand changes what is the impact on the demand when the price changes so that's actually about the price elasticity of demand now this elasticity can be measured by three methods so we are going to see in this part the measurement of the elasticity through the percentage method or the total expenditure method or say geometric methods also known as the point method to measure the price elasticity so friends in this part in the unit number 2 we are going to see the detailed discussion on the consumer behavior and demand which you can find in the class 12th microeconomics approximately chapter number 2 friends this brings us to the second part of the syllabus you see we have just discussed that whole syllabus can be bifurcated into three broad parts one was the introduction or introductory microeconomics so the unit number 1 and unit number 2 they would be covered in the micro economics part which brings us to the next part which is the introductory macro economics so the unit number 3 would be actually covering the second part that is the macro economics so you see friends the third unit is actually about the introductory macro economics when the study of resources the study of production study of consumption is taken at the level of a say nation at a larger scale that is the macro economics so we shall be looking at the introductory macro economics friends what happens actually is you see the first part would be about the meaning we have to understand in depth about the micro and the macro micro means regarding at the level of the individual or a firm macro actually means study at the level of say some country some bigger aspect so here what we have the meaning would be covered first part the second part would be friends the circular flow of income in this part we are going to see how income has a circular flow you can have a look though we are going to see in depth in the coming discussions when we discuss the third unit so we are going to see how the income has a circular flow that from the firms to individuals individuals may provide say labor and firms may pay them a salary or a wages so this is something which 
represents a circular flow of income so we are going to see how using the circular flow of income we actually understand the gdp the gross domestic product gdp for a nation would be studied in all the details from the gdp after adding the net factor income from abroad nfia we compute the gnp from gnp after subtracting the depreciation or say from the gdp after subtracting the depreciation we get the ndp and the nnp is also measured by subtracting the depreciation from the gnp so we are going to see in details how the gdp gnp ndp nnp are computed both at the market prices and at the factor cost the cost at which the production takes place at the factory levels and the cost at which the goods are sold in the market so this unit will have the coverage to the concepts of gdp then we shall be measuring the concept of national income we shall see how from gdp gnp nnp we compute the concept or we compute the data regarding the national income and then see friends in the national income part we have been ordered to compute gdp we are going to see we would be looking at the different ways to compute the gdp it may be through the value added method we also call the gva method or say income method and the third would be the expenditure method because you see the value addition in the firms would lead to the income of the individuals and the individuals spending would also represent the same amount and that is why the gdp can be calculated through the three methods the gva method or the value addition method the income method and the expenditure method so friends in this part the first unit of the macroeconomics otherwise the third unit of the whole syllabus would be something on which we are going to see about the concept of the macroeconomics the gdp gnp nnp ndp etc this brings us to friends the fourth unit and you see this is again a bigger aspect which is about the determination of income and employment so friends in this part we are going to see the concepts of income and employment you see what happens see in this part we are going to look after the concept of the aggregate demand you see aggregate demand is the sum total of all the demand the whole demand in the macro economy or a broad economy earlier we talked about the demand of a individual or a firm or a entity but in the macro part unit number 4 we are going to see the concept of the aggregate demand the total demand in the economy and similarly we would be looking at the aggregate supply and their components the components of demand and the supplies friends when we have some income then we either consume that income or we tend to save so after that we are going to look after the tendency or the propensity to either consume or save so we shall see from the two methods the average and the marginal methods to study the tendencies the propensities to either consume or to save the third friends point is the concept of involuntary unemployment that is a person is willing to work at the prevailing wages but he or she is not getting a work that is the involuntary unemployment and the concept of the full employment so friends the third the fourth unit will have the concepts of employment as well employment as well as the involuntary unemployment the fourth point would be the discussion on the determination of income and employment the two sector model we just saw that how we have a circular flow it has two sectors the production by the firms and the consumption by the entities so we are going to look also after the two sector model in order to understand the employment and the income so income and unemployment or employment study by the two sector model would be again our point of discussion in the fourth unit then friends concept of investment multiplier you see the government invests any money that is pumped in the economy will lead to higher output than the money that was invested so investment gets multiplied so we are going to see the concept of 
investment multiplier you see often the government talks about pumping money spending on the infrastructure investments are to be focused upon why because investments whatever they are done the result or the output is higher than what is invested and that is why we are going to see the concept of the investment multiplier and how it works the next point friends would be about the problems of excess and deficit demand because you see the excess demand may lead to inflation the deficient demand will lead to the contraction of the economy so here in this part we are going to see the problems of either excess or a deficit demand both are not the points where economy can function effectively and efficiently and that is why the these points would be discussed and then friends the last point in the fourth unit would be about the measures to control the excess and the deficient demand you see friends the amount of credit which is being developed in the economy may lead to the demands so suppose there is a very high demand excess demand the amount of money supply due to credit may be handy to control the money supply and to control the excessive demand and that is why the availability of the credit etc the change of the credit will lead to some instruments which may affect the aggregate demand in the economy and you see whenever the economy slows down the focus is to increase the demand and that is why friends this unit the fourth unit is about the determination of income and employment with respect to the aspects of say aggregate demand supply propensity to either consume or to save or the involuntary unemployment or the other aspects would be discussed in all the details friends this brings us to the next unit number 5 with regard to money and banking you see the existence of this unit can be traced back to the fourth unit last point because you see the measures to correct excess demand goes through the money supply if we manage to manipulate the money supply we can able to control the effective demand and other aspects and that is why the next would be of course money and banking so in which we are going to see the concept of money various forms of money the narrow money broad money fiat money reserve money high powered money and all forms of money would be discussed in this part how this money concept evolved and we have reached to a digital currency mode so in this part we are going to see all from the scratch to the present level of current affairs with re uh, regard to money then friends the functions of money what are the various functions of money and the forms of money that are being used friends the money is regulated by rbi right and that is why we have the concept of monetary policy so we are going to see the role of the central bank that is the rbi so in this part we are going to see the functions of rbi the role of rbi and how they with what tools they try to manage the money supply what is the monetary policy committee and all the relevant content regarding the role of the central bank that is the rbi we had multiple tools the repo reverse repo etc by which the rbi or the central bank regulates the money supply in order to create demand or to cut down excessive demand which leads to inflation and that is why we are going to see the concept of the central bank and then a bigger aspect friends would be on the commercial banking system the discussion would be on all the forms of the banks in the country with a focus on the commercial banking system like the sbi the icici and the various concepts regarding the npa regarding the capital adequacy ratio and all the concepts which you are supposed to know with respect to the commercial banks of course the discussion would be contained up to class 12th ncert because that is what you are supposed to know right but still at times we can we will go in some depths to understand the topics in a much detailed and to feel the topic of a money and banking so friends here some practical knowledge would also be added to make you feel the subject to feel the topic that how this money functions how the bank functions 
and what problems occur when the NPAs also increase. So here friends, the fifth unit would be about the money and banking, which brings us to the sixth one, which is the government budget and the economy. Friends, a record of the estimated expenditures and receipts for the upcoming financial year is budget, right? So we are going to see in this unit the concept of government budget and of course the economy, right? How the budget affects agriculture, industries, the services and all aspects of the economy. Friends, in this part, we first would be looking at the meaning and the components of the government budget. So government budgeting would be studied that how it is presented, which who presents the budget, what are the components of the government budget with some touch to the aspects of the constitution that under article 112, we have an annual financial statement. Then friends, objectives of the government budget, that is to, we shall see that how the budget is a document, is a tool to maximize the socio-economic development, create jobs, promote agriculture and other aspects of the rural development as well. So the second point would be discussion on the objectives of the government budget. The third would be friends about the classification of receipts that is the revenue and the capital. So the point would be friends you see we shall see in detail that the budget has see two components the receipts and the expenditure. The whole budget can be uh, divided into two broad accounts revenue and capital and we shall see what are the components of the revenue and what are the components of the capital budget. So we shall see how the expenditures and how the receipts are classified. Both receipts and expenditures are classified in two terms revenue and capital and as a result we also see the distinguish or the differentiation of the plan and the non plan budget. So in this part we shall see the difference of the plan and the non plan however you see after the planning commission was actually dissolved and Niti Aayog uh, came in the existence. This classification is not that much uh, in use but we shall see the difference between the plan and the non plan budget and also this is more important that is the development and non-developmental because some money is spent on development and some is spent on the maintenance of the economy like the salaries. So we shall see the in-depth concept of development and non-developmental expenditures or the budgeting. So friends this point would be about a wide classification of the budgeting system on the plan, non-plan, revenue, capital, receipts, expenditures and the development and the non-developmental aspect of the budget. This friends brings us to the next part, the balanced budget, the surplus budget, the deficit budget. Friends you see, budget we saw is about a record of the estimated expenditures and the receipts of the upcoming financial year. It may happen that the money to be spent is higher than the money to be received. It may be vice versa as well that the money received may be higher than the money to be spent and that is why we come to the discussion of the surplus or the deficit budget. So the deficit budget leads to the deficits of various types and the surplus budget will lead the government to have more money in the kitty and the government may use that money to lower down the previous debts. So here we shall be discussing in detail about the balanced budget, the surplus budget, the deficit budget and the implications because you see friends if the deficit is there in the budget which means the government will have to borrow money from the market which will lead to the higher interest payments in the future expenditures and that is why the government debt to GDP ratio will increase because the debts would increase by way of borrowing to fund the deficit budget so we would be discussing the implications of the budget, the deficits and the surplus. Friends, this brings us to the discussion. We will be discussing about the various types of deficits. You see, if you see the budget document, you find four types of deficits. The fiscal deficit, the revenue deficit, the effective revenue deficit 
and the primary deficit. So we are going to see here three deficits because we have three names here. So we are going to see the primary deficit, the fiscal deficit and the revenue deficit including the meanings and the implications because any deficit would only mean the government is running short of the resources and the government is actually dependent on the borrowings which will affect the sustainability in the long term and that is why this would be an aspect to understand and the, at the end we have friends to contain the different deficits because you see having deficits is one thing the purpose should be to contain the deficit so that the government can run a sustainable uh, economic management and that is why we would be discussing how the budget deficits how the fiscal deficits would be contained to make the system the economy sustainable and friends this would be our main content in the unit number six the seventh unit friends is about the balance of payments a country has various transaction with the outside world when we record those economic transactions that record a systematic record is called balance of payments so we are going to see the concept of the bop and you see when we transact with a foreign country we have to use some currencies which are used by them which are popular which are in the usage and that is why we are going to see the concept of the foreign exchange rate that what what rate the currencies are exchanged and we have you see the various forms of the exchange rates it may be fixed it may be managed it may be floating so we we are going to see the fixed and the flexible rates of exchange the merits and demerits of each of them and how they are determined how the currency exchange rate is determined by the modes of the demand and the supply so friends we are going to see the first part here the second would be of course the meaning and the components of bop the balance of payments we shall see the current account capital account and various trade accounts so in the bop we have two accounts itself the current account and the capital account in the current account we have multiple accounts like trade account so we shall see the bop in detail along with the meanings and the components at the end we shall see the brief analysis of the recent exchange rate issues friends you see after the russia ukraine war the dollars have left the country due to the volatile markets the rupee has depreciated and the depreciation of rupee has led to multiple trade issues so in this part with respect to the current scenario the current demand supply mismatch we shall look after the issues of the exchange rate and this would be very interesting part to study because here we can link our knowledge with the current perspectives of the war of the outflow of the money from india to the global markets with respect to the crisis so this unit friends would be about the bop and all the major aspects of bop with regard to the fixed exchange rates the bop accounts the devaluation depreciation and also we shall look after the concepts like convertibility to understand the concepts in a better way friends this brings us to the third unit you see again we in the first part saw that the whole syllabus of economics for the cuet has three parts so we have seen the introductory microeconomics syllabus we have seen the introductory macroeconomics syllabus now we are left with the third part in which we are going to see the india's economic development friends what happens here is you see the third part would be about the economic development you see in this part starting from unit number 8 we are going to see the historical perspective of india's economic development that how we have progressed and for that we have to understand what was our economy like on the eve of independence on the evening of independence what we were like what was the agriculture production what was the unemployment what was the forex etc would be seen in this part that is the brief introduction 
to the state of economy on the eve of the independence imagine tomorrow is independence day tomorrow the britishers are going to leave india so what was economy today by today evening would be what would be discussed in this part which would be very interesting to know that on what state the colonial masters left india and how we have progressed ourselves from that day to the present day friends we are going to see the economic systems that we adopted as socialism or the socialistic patterns of the economic system we are shifting to the capitalism we today are a, a mixed economy so we are going to see the economic systems and the common goals of the five year plans in this part friends we shall going to see the five year plans that is the plans we make we have made since 1951 the first plan was made in 1951 to 56 and what we had the goals how we achieved what we could not achieve what is the state of the present economy so all these things would be seen from the angle of the five year plans in this unit and entry number say 2 after this friends we are going to see that about the main features of agriculture see agriculture is the backbone of india's economy so the food security majority of employment comes from agriculture that is why we are going to see the main features the problems and the policies of agriculture the aspects which are institutional as well as the new policies which are being taken by the government to the ob fulfill the objective that is the doubling farmer's income by 2022 so in this part we are going to see in depth about india's agriculture the prospects the challenges and the new developments friends after that we are going to see our industrial development right from the industrial policy resolution 1956 and all about the small scale industries ssi you see ssis are the nurseries of big industries so we would look after the concepts of the ssi the iprs and how this has transformed into the concepts like make in india and this will be discussed in the details 56 69 73 77 80 91 2011 2014 20, and other forms of the industrial policies and friends the discussion on the foreign trade with respect to industries and the small scale industries so this part friends this unit would be about india's economic reforms since 1991 that we call as the liberalization privatization and globalization so we are going to see in depth about the lpg reforms what compelled us to bring reforms what where we failed what we could not achieve which compelled us to adopt reforms called lpg so friends here expenditures or the experience of our own expenditures in agriculture industries our budget in those aspects would be also studied with respect to the five year plans and the economy on the eve of independence so friends this would be our eighth unit under the third part that is indian economic development friends the ninth unit would be about the current challenges of the india's economy this is all about the current perspectives you see all our discussion will have all the current aspects because without the current aspect the study becomes superficial so till the time what has happened everything would be a part of the discussion of the economy that we'll have so here we shall talk about the poverty the concepts absolute and the relative poverty the concept of say deprivation through gini coefficient we shall talk about the main programs of poverty alleviation till the date the pradhan mantri swanidhi yojana pradhan mantri kusum yojana the national food security act and all other schemes uh, and the programs taken for the poverty alleviation we shall assess we shall assess the programs critically that is how have we performed in the poverty alleviation the slogan of garibi hatao was given in which year we shall see and what are the results of the schemes that we have taken so the first 
point would be about the poverty, the discussion on the poverty alleviation. The second point would be about the human capital formation. Friends, you see, India's strength is the population. The demography, if it is educated, it can convert to a demographic dividend. So, we are going to see here the human capital formation. You see, among the four factors of production, one is the human capital. So, we are going to see here the human capital formation that how people become resource. They need to be educated. They need to be trained. They need to be skilled. So, they become a resource. And the role of human development in the economic development because unless we have the human capital used properly, we can't have a great or a good economic development. So, here we shall be looking at the human capital formation. The third point would be the rural development regarding the credit and the marketing friends. You see, agriculture production, the rural production is not that big issue. The issue is majorly about the marketing of the products they have produced. So, apart from the agricultural diversification, right, in order to maximize the income of the farmers, we are going to see here about the rural development, the key issues of the credit, how they face issues in the getting the loans from the various cooperatives, from the small banks, from the big corporate banks. And then, friends, we shall talk about the employment part, the workforce participation rate, the labor force, the uh, labor force, the labor force participation rate, the workforce, the labor force, etc. would be discussed in this part, friends, along with the concept of the working age population. So, this part would be about the growth and changes in the work participation. You see, friends, the labor force participation is not a constant thing. Due to the rise of the education, the labor force participation changes. Due to the women empowerment, the labor force participation changes. And that is why we have to see that how, or what are the factors that lead to the change in the workforce participation and the formal and the informal sectors, that how they are different and what leads to the rise of the formal sector in the last few couple of years. The problems and the policies with regard to employment the initiatives of skill development, still we have the problem regarding the skill development, employment. So, all these would be a part of our unit number 9. So, this would be our broad discussion covering the current challenges with respect to India's economy and this will be containing a big aspect of the current data statistics and the analysis of the present state of India's economy. Friends, the last, you see, after that, the points are infrastructure. The, see, we have discussed about the human capital. So, you see here, the human capital, the human health, the problems, policies, and they actually are a part of the same part, that in which part we shall be discussing about the sustainable economic development. You see, we have a sustainable uh, development goals called the SDGs. We are bound to by ourselves to fulfill the objectives by 2030. So, we are going to see here the concept of the sustainable development, the concept how to alleviate poverty, how to eliminate the hunger, how to have a better cities which is sustainable, how to preserve the climate change etc. So, the concept of global warming and environment etc. would be covered in the same part and we have seen that the current status of India's economy with respect to infrastructure, human health, the global uh, warming, etc. would be covered in the unit number 9. And friends, the last unit would be about the development experience of India. Friends, this would be a part which is more about a comparative study of India along with the neighbors and the world. You see friends, very often, we see a data that Bangladesh per capita income has surpassed India. So, we are very curious to know that what changes Bangladesh made, which made Bangladesh PCI 
more than Indian per capita income. So, our study here in this unit would be about a comparison with the neighbors, especially with Bangladesh and the emerging economy. You see, Bhutan talks about the gross national happiness. So, we shall see a bit about the concept of the global or the gross uh, happiness concept, gross national happiness. While we compare with the neighbors, we talk about the Bhuta, Bangladesh, that how Bangladesh has performed well than India in the per capita income. So, our discussion would be on the comparison with the neighbors with respect to their own strengths and our weaknesses. Then friends, India and Pakistan, you see, on the economic front, we can't be compared with Pakistan because India is far ahead then Pakistan in the uh, concept of economy, but with respect to the happiness, with respect to HDI, with respect to poverty, etc., the two countries can be compared. But the most important part is we have to see how or what have been the trajectory of growth of the two nations post-independence and post-partition. So here we shall be discussing India-Pakistan. Friends, Third would be India and China. What makes China a giant exporter? What makes China a big reservoir of the foreign exchange reserves? What makes China to undertake a global banking system out of the 20 top banks? At least 50% banks belong to China. So we are going to see that what changes China made which could not be made by India, which made China this global giant which is placing the impact on the world economy and the polity, the one belt, one road project of China affecting the interest of the countries like Sri Lanka is also to be studied because what problems Sri Lanka made is something to be studied with respect to Chinese economic and political policies. Then friends, we are going to see the issues with respect to the economic growth, population, the sectoral development and other human development indicators like the health, the literacy, the life expectancy, the other aspects of human development. So friends, this part of our discussion would be about our own development vis-a-vis -vis the development indicators of the neighboring countries, particularly say China and the Sark nations including Pakistan. So friends, this would be our broad syllabus in which we are going to see one by one of each the topics. So, if I summarize for you, friends, we have this syllabus for CUET, which is classified into three parts. So, unit are fragmented into three parts and all of them would be dealt separately with all the depth and the details in the coming lectures. Friends, this was all about the Discussion on the CUET syllabus. We have seen the uh, syllabus in details and then we now start the discussion on the topics one by one. Thank you.